Now, we have our innovation exchange session, shared learnings from someone with bags of technology leadership experience. And today, we're going to be taking a look at how we prepare for success at the board level and beyond. As Global Chief Information Officer over at Deloitte, our next guest was responsible for all facets of technology, strategy, cyber and operations, and oversaw a $2 billion technology organisation with more than 10,000 IT professionals working across 175 different countries. He has over 35 years of experience, creating value through inspired strategic leadership. He's a digital and technology transformation expert with deep experience in complex enterprise systems. And he's here to share that experience with us today. Here to talk about how technology leadership is shifting and what you need to do to prepare for what might come next. Please welcome our next speaker, the brilliant Larry Quinlan, former Global Chief Information Officer over at Deloitte. Larry, many thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you. That was quite an enthusiastic introduction. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. I do my best, Larry. Uh, listen, uh, where are you calling from today, Larry? Where, where are you in the world? I'm actually in the grill, Jamaica, down here for an event and, and pleased that I could join you from here. <laughs> I wish I was there with you, Larry. Uh, I'm glad for you that you are there, though. So uh, lovely for you. Um, listen, we're going to talk today a little bit about the, um, the shifting uh, nature of the CIO role, um, how things are changing, what we might need to think about next, um, as well as all of your experience and what you've learned over that time. Um, so really looking forward to digging in to that with you in just a moment. Folks, if you do have any questions for Larry, as ever, please do let us know. Our producers will get you up here as soon as possible and uh, we'll get those questions over to him. Um, but Larry, let's maybe, um, let's maybe start at the top, if we can. Um, you've obviously had a, a long and distinguished technology career. Um, how did you get into the field in the first place? What attracted you to it? You know, first, I wasn't attracted to technology. My dad was sort of a self-made entrepreneur and, and my plan was always to to go into business. And in grad school, I got really interested in technology, spent a few extra months, uh, accepted a job in sales, really. And it was over that summer as I contemplated taking on this job in sales, it was going to be selling paper on Wall Street. I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do that, that that I was meant to to do something different. And I, I turned down that job with no other prospects. Uh, pounded the pavement in, in New York City until after hundreds of resumes, I found a job. It was an operations job that was technology enabled and realized that I had found my calling. It didn't help that it paid half of what the sales job was going to pay in my family thought I was nuts. But I followed that little voice inside me and ended up in technology and have never regretted it, not one day since. Yeah, great. Uh, great to hear. Well, I mean, obviously, there's a, probably a sales element to the modern CIO role, and maybe we can uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, <laughs> later on as we go into this. Um, but, but obviously, you've seen a lot of change over that time in, in IT, in the IT field, in the nature of IT leadership. Um, no more so probably than in the last couple of years. What's been the um, what's been the kind of the biggest shift you've seen over that period? The big shift for me has been the transformational nature of the CIO role. I have to acknowledge up front that that's not true in all companies. It's not true for all CIOs. But salvation lies in embracing that transformational nature. When I started out in the role. It was all about X.25 circuits. I know some of you are too young to, uh, to know anything about that. Uh, and back end, back office kinds of things. And then we moved to break fix and, and laptops. And by the way, I'm not saying that in a very dismissive way. I still believe that the laptop platform that our people use is one of the important responsibilities of a CIO. Right? But beyond all of that is the change to transformation. For very often we see a CIO in a silo and someone else doing the digital transformation of the organization. It becomes really important to embrace that digital transformation that 
that really deals with how we change the competitive nature and create competitive advantage for an organization that a CIO has truly become involved in, presenting to the board on numerous occasions, sitting in the executive committee, that's the future of the role. It's a really interesting point, Larry, uh, because I think there's, uh, there's lots of senior leadership roles that are related to the technology sphere. Um, obviously, we've got the CIO, we've got the CTO, um, CDOs of multiple different flavours. We've got chief operations officers who have, uh, you know, one hand in terms of technology. Um, how important is it for the CIO role to actually take that leadership role in, in driving the transformation? You know, does, does it matter what the job title is um, when we're talking about transformation? I don't know if it matters what the job title is, but it is important for the CIO to be a leader in this space. If a CIO is simply one of many, there's somebody else doing data, there's somebody else doing cyber, there's somebody else doing transformation, there's somebody else doing everything, then the CIO gets squeezed and ultimately that CIO role becomes not truly important other than to provide the underlying infrastructure for other people to get things done. My personal opinion, I, I freely admit, it's one guy's opinion, that the future of the role is about leading all of those things. At some point, all of this has to come together. If it all reports up to completely different places, you'll end up with a mishmash of policies uh, technologies that don't integrate, and a CIO really trying to fight a rear guard action. So again, my strongly held opinion, as I'm sure you can sense, is that a CIO has to pull it all together. The days have passed when a dictator CIO insists on writing every line of code. That's never going to happen again in most industry sectors. There's got to be some democracy in the process. There have to be frameworks that allow lines of business to create assets. So I am absolutely not advocating for those old days because, quite frankly, I think they made CIOs fail. But creating the kind of environment where frameworks exist, where an understanding of who controls those levers is really important, and having a CIO really driving the agenda and being responsible for the digital transformation of the organization is imperative. Yeah, great. I love the, uh, love the passion coming through here, Larry. Uh, but well, let's maybe talk us through um, some of your experiences in your own roles, the, the multiple roles that you've had over the years, in terms of facilitating that leadership. Uh, within the, CI, the IT function. Um, what's, been, what's been important to you? Maybe you can talk us through a couple of examples of pivotal moments or, or transformative moments that have really defined how you think about this role. Sure. Now, first, I have to remind you that I served as the global CIO of Deloitte, and Deloitte is like the world's largest uh, technology consulting and cyber consulting, etc. And I tell you that because it means that you know, every systems analyst there you know, religiously believes that they can do my job far better than I could with one hand tied behind their back. So how you approach the role in an environment like that is, is interesting. And a combination of a creating an environment where people actually believe that you care for them, that you care about them. And I know that's a strange place to start for a technology leader, but you know, fundamentally, people don't really care where you want to go <laughs> uh, unless they understand what your passions are, who you are, and what you're trying to accomplish. There's an old adage, you know, people just don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So really establishing that trust becomes truly critical to get the agenda passed. Second, it's understanding. And it took me a while to do that. You know, I grew up young and cocky and believed that the role of everyone was to simply agree with me. Uh, quickly learned that, <laughs> that perhaps that's not the way they viewed their roles on the planet. Uh, but really understanding 
uh, how to create frameworks that allowed people to get things done. As I go back to the old days of the CIO ensuring that everything passed through them, that's not going to happen. We've got to enable people to be productive, and technology allows them to be productive. At the same time, we have to take responsibility for the big projects, and we have to create underlying frameworks that allow people to create assets on top of the frameworks that we provide with the security that we embed deployed in ways that are scalable uh, for the enterprise, and the CIO has to own that. So in my role, we created the kind of what we call the technology operating model uh, that allowed our lines of business to create the assets they needed uh, while operating in the framework and in the hubs uh, that, that we provided. Yeah, almost, uh, am I thinking in terms of guardrails? Is that an apt description for this type of approach? You're kind of, you're saying parameters within pe which people can work within. I think it's more than guardrails, and I need to stress that point. If the role of the CIO is simply to provide a guardrail, then we become traffic cops. Again, in no way disparaging traffic cops in case I get stopped later on. Uh, this is really about creating an entire environment. It's about creating uh, the framework that the assets can be built in. It's about creating the technology that allows the creation of the assets. It's about automating that supply chain uh, all the way to promote to production. And the CIO pushes those buttons, creates those capabilities. So it's not about just telling people, here are the rules, you have to follow them. That's necessary, but if that's just the role of the CIO, again, you, you become a traffic cop. I'm really talking about building an entire supply chain. It's building not just the guardrails, but the highway itself. It's about building the capability that people can parachute in, create assets within that framework, where you have visibility of those assets throughout the production process, where you can stop something if it's dangerous, where the promote to production is automated, where cyber is embedded. And now we're really creating something that allows the enterprise to flourish, as opposed to a guardrail concept that simply tells people no. Yeah, great, love the distinction. Uh, but it feels to me that there's, uh, there's a couple of words that that are jumping out there. One is this idea of trust, and the other one is this idea of agency, giving people the, the, the power to, to be able to act for themselves and, and provide value to the organisation. What are the key levers for you in terms of creating that type of culture? We talk a lot about winning hearts and minds. How did you approach it at Deloitte? Somewhat paradoxical, actually. Trust, but also authority. Right? You can build all the trust you want. You can be a, a great person. You can, uh, you know, people can love working with you. But if they realize you have no authority, they're just going to go around you. So it's really a two-step process. One is showing people you care, creating the kinds of frameworks, uh, enabling them. But at the same time, we went to the board. Uh, we talked at the executive committee about our operating model. We wanted to ensure that this was something our businesses paid attention to, that this was something that we could spread across an entire enterprise. So getting it approved at the board level became absolutely important to its success. People had to know that this is the way our enterprise is going to operate, that this is the framework we're going to use uh, to build assets that this is the security that's absolutely required. And these are the roles and responsibilities of the team. And the team becomes absolutely important because at various parts of our history, it's been an us versus them kind of concept, IT versus the rest. And you know, in an IT versus the rest fight, IT usually doesn't win. <laughs> so the team really is made up of multiple people. I, I liken it to a, you know, a soccer team. You've got 11 people on the team. And in the old days, it used to be 
you know, IT was on the field and the businesses were in the bleachers, right? They're in the stadium looking at the game. And at the end of it, their questions usually were, why didn't you score more goals? Okay, so you got around to scoring more goals, and their questions became, well, why didn't you score more goals cheaper? And at some point, they got fed up of this game, and they went off and they created a completely separate soccer team on a different field. And sometimes they kept the location of the field secret. So now we really got to change that dynamic. It's not us versus them. It's a, it's a team of people where you can't even tell the difference at times. Some people are, are in IT. Some people are in the line of business. Some people are from legal, wherever they need to be. But they all have a common purpose, operating under a common technology operating model, using a common framework, instrumented in a common way to create differentiated assets. That's the goal. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Um, this idea of, of leadership, and especially when it comes to working within these cross-functional teams and, and working with different partners and stakeholders across the business, that one team that you just mentioned there, um, I guess one of the things there that you're often charged with managing folks that aren't necessarily within your direct jurisdiction. You're, you're certainly leading and providing leadership to those folks. Um, how have you approached that? How have you approached leadership that's not necessarily within your direct reports? You know, first, an acknowledgement that if the CIO is going to get anything really important done in the enterprise in today's world, then it absolutely requires influencing and managing people who are not within our direct line of control. The things that are within the CIO's direct control tend to be more infrastructure, break-fix kinds of things. Again, nothing wrong with that. But as you venture out and begin to think about transforming the enterprise, the enterprise doesn't belong to the CIO. So if you're going to digitally transform something that doesn't actually belong to you, it belongs to divisional CEOs who have those P&L responsibilities for the most part. It belongs to the enterprise CEO and the board. Then by its very definition, transformation of that requires uh, influencing others who don't uh, work for you. And it's back to those two things, trust and authority. There has got to be some level of authority for the CIO. If the CIO is simply running around, jumping on planes, getting on calls, begging to be a part of the table, you know, you can be the world's most talented CIO without some level of authority. It does become challenging. So there needs to be an understanding that on big projects, there are two throats to choke. I, I know lots of people want one throat to choke. I'm not a big fan of the one throat to choke. I actually believe on big transformation of business kinds of projects, CIO should be right there uh, and line of business leader right there. And together, they're responsible. Their bonuses are dependent on that kind of working together to make it happen. Because the CIO alone can't do the digital transformation of the organization, but simply saying there's one throat to choke and that's the PL leader really deprives the organization of the expertise of the CIO to make it happen. So creating trust, giving up some power. I believe that lines of business leaders are going to have to have evaluative and compensation power over CIOs at some point in time, right? We really have to say we give up power to be evaluated by others if we truly want to have a transformative role in the entire enterprise. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Thanks, uh, thanks, Larry. Um, on that note, you know, relationships and relationships with line of business leaders. Um, there was a recent Gartner study that suggested that 66% of CIOs now uh, report increased strength of their relationship with the CEO over the course of the pandemic period. I guess that's understandable given how essential technology was to facilitating much of the, the shift that we, we saw over that period. 80% um, say they're now educating senior leaders about the value of IT. How are you seeing the CEO-CIO relationship change 
over the course of the past couple of years? I think it's way better. A lot of eyes got opened in the pandemic. Uh, IT organizations responded so incredibly well to the pandemic, uh, transforming enterprises and allowing them to be competitive uh, during stay, an extended stay-at-home period. So that really helped to drive the kinds of relationships that are necessary. I, I think it was all good news, ex except maybe one pet peeve I have. There's so many executives who I talk to who somehow believe that IT organizations around the world responded heroically in a matter of days uh, to make this happen. While that's true on the surface, IT leaders like all of you had been responding for some time to come, uh, some time in the past. You had moved assets to the cloud. You had created collaborative capabilities in the organization through the implementation of technologies like Teams and Zoom and WebEx, et cetera. You had eliminated applications that didn't need to be there. You had fine-tuned your networks. You had put in software-defined networking capabilities. And all of these are the things that we relied on when the pandemic hit. So don't want to leave people with the notion that IT was doing nothing. And then when the pandemic hit, oh boy, whoa, look at these heroes who moved from zero to 100 in, in five seconds. The fact of the matter is that IT leaders had had the foresight to invest in these kinds of capabilities so that when the pandemic hit, it was a matter of scrambling to deploy them in a way or extend them in a way that allowed organizations to continue to function. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Larry. Um, I want to touch a little bit about this idea of um, the skill sets that, uh, that the modern CIO is, uh, needs because uh, you mentioned right at the outset this idea of you know turning down the role in sales uh, to to go into this tech role um, and explore the the opportunities there. Um, it feels to me that that actually demonstrating value and, and telling that that storytelling element, communication, a lot of these soft skills that we maybe sometimes associate with a sales role are increasingly important for the CIO role as well. Um, how are you seeing some of those capabilities change? You know, little did I know that the CIO role was <laughs> probably more of a sales role than selling paper on Wall Street. You know, if I had gone to sell paper on Wall Street, you know, most people would say no, and a bunch of people would say yes, and as long as your batting ratio was good enough, you'd make your bonuses and things would be good. The stakes are a lot higher in the CIO role. You can't afford too many no's. Right? We've really got to craft a vision for the enterprise that is compelling. And then we have to sell that vision. We have to sell it at regional leadership teams. We have to sell it at the executive committee. We have to sell it at the board. And it becomes so critical that it, becomes, that it gets adopted that the CIO as a salesperson is a critical aspect of this. But we also have to sense what's right. We can't afford to go sell stuff that's not the right vision, which means we have to have collaboration skills. By the time we walk in that room, we have to know, we have to sense that this is the right vision for this enterprise, that it will be adopted with some work by the leaders of the enterprise, by the other leaders uh, of the enterprise. We have to figure out our batting average in a way that's incredible. We, we have to sense that we can get it passed, that we can get it done. We have to absorb body blows along the way as people believe that they can do this job uh, way better than we can. And we have to survive that and we have to demonstrate the soundness of the thinking and the compelling nature uh, of the plan. You know, one of the things I like to say is, as people tell us how to do the job of CIO, you know, is I'd rather get fired for something I did than something I didn't do. So it's really about being bold enough to take action, being sensitive enough to understand what's going to work and what's not going to work, and combining those two things to create a compelling plan 
that can get sold and that can get delivered. Yeah, that's a pretty long list, Larry. We've got intuitive, we've got empathetic, we've got analytical, we've got courageous, um, the uh, communicative. There's a, there's a lot going on here. Um, Larry, uh, I'm going to take a pause there and we're going to take a question from the audience. So we've got Joe over in the audience. Hi, Joe. Nice to see you again. Joe, I can see you loud and clear. You might be on mute at the moment. We're just going to extend that into 2023. There we I, go. I was, yep, I was on mute. You'd think after two years <laughs> of doing this that we, I'd have it figured out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads out there. Anyway, uh, my question is, in your opinion, as the CIO, do you act as a single leader delegating down to the other C-whatevers that are within your realm? I know there's lots of different c with uh, see whatever's within the technical realm. Um, or do you see the CIO being more a part of a team of co-equals, each co-equal C-level having their own channel of authority going down into their functional areas? It's an interesting question. I, I think it depends on the organization. <laughs> Uh, I see a CIO as a team of co-equals with other C-suite members, the CEO, the chief risk officer, chief legal officer, all chartered to driving the strategy of the organization implementing. Now, there are other uh, technology leaders in the organization. They can be regional CIOs. They can be uh, digital leaders embedded in a business, depending on your particular company, there are different structures, myriad uh, different structures. I continue to stubbornly believe that the CIO has to be the leader pulling all of that uh, together. And if that's not happening, then you run the risk of the organization digitally just splintering into lots of different pieces. This does not call for the dictator CIOs. I think dictator CIOs have a very short lifespan in the world going forward. But it does call for some boldness. It does call for saying a CIO pulls all of this together and seeking that authority. It doesn't mean the CIO gets to tell everybody exactly what they're going to do and micromanage them and all of that, no. But it does mean that ultimately it needs to roll up to an executive who has responsibility for the digital transformation, the cyber well-being, and the technology direction of the enterprise. And I believe that's the CIO. Having said that, there are clearly enterprises that don't think that way and have, in fact, fragmented it and maybe some people would say fragmented is a pejorative term, who have separated it into different uh, parts of the organization. Great stuff. Thanks for sharing. Larry, how did that help, Joe? Great stuff. It Many sure does. Thanks. It sure does. Yeah. Many thanks, Joe. Many thanks. Um, so, Larry, let's... Um, uh, before we look to wrap up here, you've obviously recently stepped back from the role at, uh, at Deloitte. Um, what is next for you? What does is, what is life post-CIO at uh, one of the world's largest technology organisations look like? So I thought about this uh, for the last few years before ultimately retiring in October from the role and uh, charted what I call a chapter two that has a number of swim lanes, but chief among them, board service. So I now serve on uh, a couple of public boards, um, ServiceNow and, and John Slang LaSalle GLL. And that's been a very rewarding experience for me. I'm also serving on the boards of a number of private equity portfolio companies, so pre-IPO organizations, as well as doing some uh, advisory work, strategic advisory work in, in private equity. And I found that this is really been rewarding for me. I get to work with a number of different organizations. I get to see governance at the highest level of sophisticated, successful organizations. And with private equity, I get to see where the puck is going. I understand you know, how we analyze the industries, uh, where the money is going in terms of investments, 
and get to stay more relevant in technology. It's really been a learning experience. It's been fascinating for me. And it's truly allowed me to use the skills that I developed in the CIO role to you know, pursue a different avenue. Wonderful stuff. Larry, um, that is all we've got time for today, but many thanks for sharing your thoughts on uh, the role of the CIO, the next steps as well, um, the skills needed. A real pleasure talking to you here today. Many thanks for sparing us the time. Thank you. Have a great rest of the conference.